I wanted to be able to show people how to be righteous and do all this. And it wasn't to say that I didn't get that in Wing Chun, but the focus was a little different. When they see the application of the techniques, because applications are, are they call up such a, a faster movement, yeah. uh, people are like, wow, it's, it's not as cut and dry as that. And I said, stop, right? And then he went to punch again, so then I gripped him, right? And his knees went weak, and I grabbed his arm, and I threw him to the car. Um, but what made you decide to, that, hey, I'm gonna go ahead and do this formally and take on his name? Because legally, you changed it, correct? Okay, party people, it's Kung Fu Chronicles back with another round of five crucial questions for Kung Fu Masters. What up, it's Sifu Kwasi here with you. And quick question, are you guys following us on social media? You're missing out. Oh, yeah, I love it. Anyway, if you're feeling the content, drop a little like down below, which will let me know we're on the right track here making stuff that's good for you. And please do feel free to load up that comment section, which helps me a whole lot with the algorithm, and of course, really ensures that we can keep the conversation going. Let's get some people going. Okay, he's finally here, Sifu Supero Yi, a major player in the Hungar Kung Fu family. Sifu Yi has a very distinctive Kung Fu history as you're all about to hear about for yourselves. And oh yes, you gotta do yourself a favor and stay till the end of the video so you can see some very specific Hungar self-defense techniques as well as getting the answers to those five crucial questions. That's five. Yes, sir. So you ready? Let's do this. Yes, uh, another episode and another um, esteemed martial artist uh, with me today. I've got a, a a guy who's not only a friend of the Ying Zhao family, but also he's a martial artist, he's an instructor, a practitioner of Ditta medicine, a massage therapist, world president of Yi's Hunga, International Kung Fu Association, so much more. We'll get to talk about it all, hopefully. Sifu uh, Pedro Sapero Yi is here with me. How are you, Sifu? I'm fine, sir. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. And how are things going uh, over there? You're, you're in Jersey, right? I'm in Jersey. It's a nice, beautiful, warm day. I've been waiting for this. Man, I, I, I used to live in Jersey City. I had a place out there for years. So I'm, uh, I'm, I grew I'm, up in Jersey City. <laughs> oh, you, oh, you, oh, sorry. So we, we can talk yes. a little Jersey. In yes, the yes, definitely. <laughs> yeah, cool. So before we get going, I'm going to let the audience kind of know about our linkage here. Because I, like I mentioned before, you're a, a friend of the Ying Zhao family. You're, you're Sifu, obviously friends with my Gong. Master Shum, your Sifu, yes. uh, of course, uh, Master Frank Yi. We'll talk about him in a little bit. I just yes. saw you at our 50th anniversary, like what, a month and a yes. half ago. That was great. Yes. <laughs> that was fantastic. <laughs> I'm gonna take you a little bit back down memory lane because back in the day okay. I dug this up. I, I, I used to go oh. to the Hong Ga. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So the Hong the Fei Wang Fei Hong Northeastern All Kung Fu Championships inaugurated in 1996 was our first one here in New Jersey. There we go. Yeah, yeah. You go. <laughs> I went to the 2005. This is the one from 2005. So okay. I went to Paul and a couple of yes. other guys from uh, Ying Zhao. Um, nice. Yeah, and then some. So I, I'll get it. Oh, and I saw really quickly, I saw that um, Sifu Kisu was out there visiting with you guys. I, I, I was just with him the day before yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and he did the show a while ago, so he's a friend of my Sifu. Other innovations in, in Taekwondo that, that didn't translate well to the Northern Shaolin. The Northern Shaolin is all about the high knee. Well, he told me to tell you hello. He loves you. Uh, he says, make sure you know that, that I'm here. So that's Perfect. beautiful. So let's get it started right away. Uh, uh, okay. I'm aware of some of it, but your uh, your starts and roots in, in martial arts, how you actually got started and what age? You wow. So at age six, uh, so one of the things, my brother was older than me. And so matter, no matter where we lived, I was always like alone. So across the street from us lived, first I grew up and uh, began my first six years in Duncan Projects. And then we finally got some money. We moved a couple blocks up. And in this block, there was a Filipino family and they were two brothers. So since no one would hang with me, they would always tell me, oh, come over, right? There were five brothers all together, two brothers. One brother would teach me stick games, right? What I call stick games. And then the other brother would end up teaching me um, how to cut out a sheet metal star, throwing stars. 
Oh. And then when I was doing that, it was like, wow, okay. And uh, so they taught me how to do that. So I began with that. And then uh, some friends on the block knew Taekwondo and Gojudo Karate. So we began practicing with them. And my mother paid some guy who was a champion with the Nunchaku because of Bruce Lee craze. And he taught us a form with that. And then the auxiliary police took it away from us. And uh, like a month later, we saw the kids playing with it in the park. It was a bad deal. Uh, after that, um, I, there was a roster guy, his name was Howard Campbell, and we moved to another part of Jersey City, downtown Jersey City, and um, I saw him practicing. We had a shared yard. We lived in Via Borinca, and uh, I saw him practicing. So one morning, he calls me out. He says, hey, what are you doing? And I said, I'm watching you. He says, you like Kung Fu? I was like, yeah. And then he says, oh, you want to practice? Yeah. He says, sit in a horse dance. So I sat in a horse dance. Horse dance. Very good. I'm taking a dump. Hey! Um, and after about 10 minutes, and you know, I was I was young, like 10 or so, 10 and a half or whatever, 11. And uh, he just said, okay, he said, I'll teach you. Uh, so, and then he began teaching me. And I, to me, it was just going through some tiger claws, some this, that, whatever. And uh, he was a friend of many of the styles because he went to Ying Zhao. He went to uh, Chu Wa, I mean, Chu Lin Seven, uh, the, the Mantis. He okay. went to uh, Johnny So's Northern Shaolin. He uh, he went to the Fuja Pai. Like he was going to all these schools, but he learned with Abdul Mataka Bear and swam, right? At his swim oh. academy in Brooklyn. But years later, I found out that he was actually teaching me Fuk Fuk Kun, which is, a, you know, the second half of the first form in, in the Hoga system. And then I found out that Mataka Bear studied with my Sifu. So somewhere around the way, it came around full circle. God. And then a little later on, um, so he wanted to take me to Brooklyn to go to study with his teacher because he was moving to Brooklyn and my mom wouldn't let me go. So I was like, da da da. And, you know, as kids, we always hung out and played in Jersey City. I saw in the back of the magazine, Wing Chun. Wing Chun. And I said, hey, you know, I, 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 that's a, the, the little guy. And I was always a little guy who can defend against the big guy. And so I, uh, you know, found Lee Moi Chan's school in the back at 112 Chambers. So I ended up going there. And, uh, you know, long story short, uh, they bought, I mean, when I was young, I had rheumatoid arthritis, you know, childhood rheumatoid arthritis. And my mom was scared to let me practice. But uh, Lee Moi Chan said, well, let me take a look at him. Let me view him. You know, I do Chinese medicine and stuff. So if he can do the class, then let him join. And I did the class. And then so I joined their class. Um, fast forward a few years later, I had a child very young. Um, so I had to stop for a couple of years. And then uh, after that, um, I met Sifu. So um, I also well, actually now nah, I got to interject in here, but I also ran into um, uh, Phil Redman and um, uh, Sifu William Chung, right? Through a oh, friend. Yeah. On 40, you remember the store on Forty Second Street? And yes. Peter. Peter was behind the thing there. Yes, so yeah. Peter yeah. introduced me to William Chung, and then I got to study with their group for a little bit, for like a year or whatever, a couple of years, Chung, whatever. Yeah. yeah so I, I tested in their system up to sixth level. Um, I'm really good friends with Philip Redman. <laughs> Today we okay, still talk yeah. a lot, you know. And yeah, and, I, still, uh, I, still, I had a student on, but I still have to get him on actually on the show because I've I've had a, a bunch of Wing Chun guys, but yeah, yeah, that's great. And then uh, one of their guys I used to cover for his class for a number of months out of the year when he was in Asia. His name was. Uh, Sifu Kip Klaus. But during that time is when I transitioned with Sifu. And I transitioned with Sifu about 19 years old. Okay. So um, this year is like 40 years, 40 years, 40, where am I? I'm 60 now. So 40, 41, 40, yeah, 40 years about this year. So, um, you know, I walked in there. It was a little tiny place, you know, the room. He only had two rooms, a desk in the middle. One room was so tiny, you could barely, you know, sit horse dance and move a few steps with it. I was stuck in there for a few years. So and then when he got the big school in 1986, which was 145 Grand Street, you know, we can get we can get like 10, 12 people on the floor, basically. And then we moved there and then he started his little clinic in 1987. I started helping because I began teaching Saturday classes. Um, and then he I would be in there and I'd work patience with him and I'd be there almost every day. I'd hang out with him. And I, I got to learn the Ditta, you know, trauma, Ditta traumatology medicine from him. 
uh, and by working directly on clients. Oh, you know, this guy had broken bone. Uh, look like this. He draw a little thing. This eye bone here. Yeah, I hold the body. You pull the arm. Put it back. To me, puppet. Do it. Do it. Do it. <laughs> you know. Oh, he's a gang guy. He won't sue you. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> on so, the spot medical training <laughs> on the spot yeah so it was it was a interesting time um uh and i've been with c4 ever since in 1991 i opened my school in new jersey um so that's uh, 33 years i think this year 33 yeah. years ago i opened it um but i was 1991 i was in front yards backyards dance studios this and that and then in 1993 oh, wow. i came into this building that i'm presently at and i've been at so Okay, it's been good. a while. So talking about your Sifu, Master Frankie, uh, most yes. people know about him. Um, yes. w when you started training with him, what specifically was it about his style? Because you, you had mentioned before you did so many others. Was that like just caught, caught you, captivated you? Honga was like, okay, this is my stuff. I like it. So I was at a moment in life where I wanted the most righteous thing I could do. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, I wanted everything to be about righteousness about helping others this and that and this and that and, and you know the concern wasn't for me the concern was i wanted to be able to show people how to be righteous and do all this and it wasn't to say that i didn't get that in wing chun but the focus was a little different because they were trying to establish your organization etc and uh i just wanted somebody hole in the wall that nobody knew well i didn't know people knew him but i'm kind of a big deal <laughs> anyway i got with him and um it, it slowly, it made me a lot stronger because I was smaller when I was in Wington. You know, there's many pictures of me in the old days. I was really skinny. It's really small. Um, but this gave me strength. This gave me knockout power. This gave me, um, but most importantly, I learned a lot of philosophy for helping others, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we did so many things where we would go and help, um, you know, people in the community, uh, such as, uh, let's say, demonstrations for the workers. There was a big thing that happened in the news with some workers union, uh, with the Chinese workers union. Two workers took a vacation, they got thrown out, so they were having a demonstration. Sifu asked me to go as part of the group and, you know, have them a hat and they don't know we're not Chinese and we're like just mouthing the chants and then we're there for security. And then, you know, one dude runs out, big dude, he runs out, he grabs one of the Chinese guys, he picks him up and starts shaking him. And then Sifu said, go. So I ran. I jumped up, I grabbed him behind the neck, I ripped down, his neck started bleeding, and now he only ripped because my nail got caught in his neck. So I oh, went cool. down, and then, but he was he was over six feet, and you know, I'm only like five, seven and a half, five, eight. So right. he, he dropped the guy, he looked at me, he went to go, I dropped really low, and I was about to jump, and then the police jumped on top of us. Oh, wow. And then all of a sudden I feel I'm being dragged. My seafood reached under, dragged me by my, my arm or my jacket and pulled me out. He said, oh, good, good. He says, why are you so stupid? Why you go high? You should go low. Okay. When they go low, we go high. You said go, I just went, Sifu. I just went. I just went. <laughs> and for anyone unaware, I'm just gonna show a quick clip of your 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 Sifu here really. Yeah. Okay, this yeah, is yeah, one of the go. sections I usually demonstrate. And actually, I was going to show yours a little later uh, as yeah. we, we talk a little bit more. I was just going to show a quick segment. But it's like every time I watch your sea blues, it's just so graceful and you can sh see all that power, even though he's not a huge guy. But yes, know. he's a small guy. Yeah, right. It's he's got good. a big heart. Right. But very powerful. His 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 thought his we're always out to do something good for everyone. Yeah, which I love, which I love. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So talking specifically, Hunga, um, mm -hmm. I, um, I'm uh, familiar with a lot of people on the West Coast because, like, mm -hmm. I, I grew up on the East Coast, but then um, came out here to school and started my kung fu um, start it out here. So like mm -hmm. Sifu Don Hamby, which they do a different lineage than you guys, but yes. it's kind of giving like like a brief uh, um, kind of history of the differences between both styles, say, or lineages. So, so, no worries. So years ago, you know, there were, you know, Honggao was kind of like a basic word for all types of village styles that came out. But when Wong Fei Hong came on scene, he created what we call the orthodox style, right? Um, so he actually formulated all the forms that make the orthodox style. Um, a lot of people are not aware that he had over 127 disciples. 
So most people think today, they think it's just Lam Sai Wang Tang Fang, maybe one or two others. But, you know, there were a lot of others that were in there. Um, Lam Sai Wing is the most famous. He was the one who had the school in Hong Kong first. Uh, most of his disciples spread around the world to teach, and that's why his style was known, his version or lineage version was known better. Um, uh, Tang Feng was the younger training brother to Lam Sai Wing. So um, he taught in Foshan, right? And uh, when Tang Feng uh, passed, his wife taught. I mean, uh, not when Dong Feng, when uh, Wang Fei Hong passed, his wife moved and taught with Dong Feng. In fact, they had the first lion dance, uh, female lion dance group. And they used to perform at an orphanage every year, have a really big thing in Foshan for an orphanage every year. And they perform like that. And then in the 30s, 1937 or so, Dong Feng immigrated into Hong Kong. Um, he searched out his training brother, he needed a job. And, you know, he asked, you know, his training brother said, oh, come come you know teach in my school he said okay i will so he began teaching there and you know there's a thing that some people get misled about because his nickname was lo wan gu which means old square mine a lot of people think to say that you know we're more traditional or something like that no it's nothing to do like that the fact is most people don't know lam sai wing is the one who gave him the nickname and this was only because when he asked him to learn the other forms, because I'm sorry, we brought in a lot of more forms into the curriculum and said, do you, you know, you need to learn this. He says, I got enough. I can't take it anymore. I can't. And he, then he said, oh, you're, 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 you're stuck. Old square mind means you're just stubborn. Stubborn. Right, just right. Stubborn. in your ways. He right. says, I got enough to work on. I don't need it anymore. Right. And that was basically it. And later on, he taught for the Fish Market Association, which is a, a, a strong state for the Hong Kong people. And that was protecting, you know, where all the main money that came into Hong Kong was at. Um, and then Mai Si Gong, uh, Yun Ling was his disciple, right? And right. that's who Mai Sifu learned from, right? So, um, and then the lineage came forward. Sifu immigrated from Hong Kong. Uh, so Mai Si Gong died in 66. Mai Sifu immigrated from Hong Kong to, uh, I believe, Toronto. Um, he's been in both Toronto and Montreal, and um, he taught up there. He attended college uh, and kind of did a trade there. And then uh, he came down to Manhattan uh, one day at the invitation. First, he went to Boston and he was doing lion dance at the invitation of the Eastern U.S. Kung Fu Federation in Boston. And then he came, they saw him, said, Oh, Master Wei Hong saw him, they come to New York. So he came to New York to do the demo, and then he was walking on Mott Street, and his medicine sifu, Dr. Sit Chuk Singh, was, had an office there right on Mott. So he went to see him, but he was sick. So then he decided to stay to take care of his Sifu and run his shop. And then that's how he met up with your Sifu, who, if I'm not mistaken, your uh, your, your Sikong yes. gave him his first school. Okay, see, I was actually going to ask you about that history because I asked some other people, like, how did Frankie and my Sikong meet? But okay, mm -hmm. all right. And that's, mm -hmm. I think I'd heard that along the way. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and they were, you know, he always, you know, your Sikong always tells me, tells me your Sifu's a bad boy. Always a bad boy. <laughs> I've been a bad boy. My, you know, Sifu, Sifu, you know, sometimes he's ready to go, you know? Right. Um, but my ex-wife learned for a number of years at uh, with your Sigong. So I sat in the box. I actually sat in the box for like three years and I would watch the classes, but I would hear how everyone would comment about how wonderful it was that everybody's moving, you know, hanging claw, boom, 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 everybody's moving in unison. And this is how people were joining. So people don't know, when I opened my school, I formulated between our stance and the drills to be the same um, method. Right. Okay. Start start with this uh, stretching, loosen the joints, stretching. You know, we have qigong, and then uh, we go into stance training, and stances with punches, and then drills before we break off into forms or fighting, whatever. So I used right. that method because I heard that's what everyone loved, and you know, actually, <laughs> people love to see an art in, in its entirety, and people right. who watched got it going up to your qigong school got to see this all happening. Right. And then, and then okay, that's right. And then we're all yes. doing the form together and everything. Yeah, no, that's true. It it people up. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. That's very interesting. Okay, that's some good history to know. Um, <laughs> so then, so talking about your teaching history, when did you know you wanted to teach? Also, like, um, well, you natural for you? my decision was at six years old. Oh wow, to teach! I, I saw Bruce Lee. You have offended my family. And so my decision was, I wanted to teach. 
uh, women how not to be beat up by men because my father was abusive to my mom. My mom, I won't let her watch this because she always gets angry if I talk about it, but it's okay. the reason why. I can't not do it. So that was always my goal, you know? And, and so um, in, in saying that, that happened so many years. I remember a year and a half, an incident that happened where my father found us, et cetera, and I, you know, I was helpless because I was a year and a half old, right? But I remember it clearly in my mind, right? So, but when I was six years old, that was my decision. So, got it. Okay. Um, never yeah. changed. Never yeah, no, that, you know, it's a good motivator. Um, so I'm going to take you back in time for just a little bit because we were talking about self-defense fighting and I found mm -hmm. a, a cool well, clip of you here. Uh, six to eight weeks oh ago, my gosh. Right. Like, <laughs> this is when I was upstairs. <laughs> your body. Okay. My, my Michael Jackson voice yeah, and mustache. Uh, so so specifically when you're teaching the classes, this is what you're talking about, how you yeah, yeah. Yeah. do your group body. classes and everything and like yeah. that, right? This yes. is one of your... First schools in New Jersey? So this was when we moved in this building upstairs. This was probably in 1993, okay. 94. Got it. Oh, I look like Michael Jackson. There you go. Look, look at my mustache. So really quick, I'm, I have a part here that because I love what you said about um, forms and fighting particularly mm -hmm. here. In your schools, there are a number of champions and, and apt kung fu fighters. What do you, what, how do you stress that? Uh, full contact training and that which also translates obviously to self defense right uh, it's it's very important uh, a lot of schools concentrate on forms practice uh, forms practice alone does not constitute fighting ability okay what happens is you train forms your forms become your dictionary of fighting techniques but you have to break apart that form uh, and put together certain combinations and when you put together those combinations, you practice them in drills. After they're practicing drills, you work them with a partner, and then you begin your free fighting or free sparring. Uh, it's important in the beginning stages to start out with light contact. After you develop uh, some kind of skill at that point, then we can move into the full contact. We uh, have produced a championship full contact team in 1993. Uh, so, you know, it will lead eventually to full contact if that's your forte. Nice. So do you still have that uh, way of thinking or has it evolved in any way since then? A while so, ago, right? so yeah. So, um, through the years, of course, you get more experience, right? You get more experience, you have more, uh, more, and, and you deal with teaching more people. So you find easier ways to get the points across. Um, so let's say my drills have moved into, uh, becoming more dynamic right and and i become better as a teacher in creating the co uh, the combinations that work and uh, you know everything it's either i used it uh you know my students used it in a, you know full contact competition etc uh or i've used it on the street or they may have used it on the street um but eventually the skills do come in pretty heavy but my thought process is the same you know you need form because form trains structure number one it trains breathing number two it trains uh the, the eye focus people don't understand when the eyes are not there the power is not 100 percent, right so right. so that's why the eyes are real important in this and it helps to lock the body because when you do things with body connection you're making power to make power have you have to be able to have, release the power and have to explode right but yes. if everything is not connected at that moment it's not going to explode the form teaches you this right um but it but besides structure and eyes it's all the the basics of the art the stance training how to move etc cetera, etc cetera. so all of these things are good to do especially when you don't have a partner but if it's practiced correctly people can practice forms like dancing and not be there physically when somebody watches your form they have to feel like oh my god they have to feel like this is happening right. because it makes it feel like you're in a real fight Right. Right. And people exactly. are like, oh, my God, I don't know what you did, but I know it was good. You know, that's kind right. of the things that I've heard when I demonstrated. Because um, they can kind of see the applications as you're doing them, which is that yes. like the, yes. the, the, you know, the pinnacle when you're doing a form correctly. Mm -hmm, no. mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, talking about well, we talked a little bit of briefly about it before in the beginning. The Wong mm -hmm. Fei Hong tournament that you guys used to throw, and when yes. did this, when did it start, and why did you guys have to end it eventually? So, so uh, the first tournament was in uh, uh, nineteen ninety six. Right. Yeah. So people said we should throw a championship. There's championships all around. Let's do it. Let's do one here and make it all kung fu championship. But it wasn't all kung fu because we allowed the fighting to be open to everyone. Right. So that was kind of a, a little different in, in the thing, but the Kung Fu forms were Kung Fu forms, Kung Fu divisions, but we also had open division. And in the open division, 
um, anybody can do any forms, Taekwondo, Karate, whatever. And people would come in. But the main thing they really loved is that we allowed the fighting to be everything. Then in the Chinese, the Sui Jiao division, uh, or Sui Jiao, uh, the Chinese wrestling division, we allowed Jiu Jitsu, we allowed Judo, we allowed the, you know, Hapkido, the throwing arts to get in there and do. So it was really unique in that respect. But we wanted something to showcase, but also something in the name of our lineage. So that's why we dubbed it the Wang Fei Hung Northeastern All Kung Fu Championships. And it grew to maybe the fourth largest tournament in the country, nearing 500 competitors. Um, and, you know, we had it run like so, so key that we would open the door at eight, we would be registered by 9.30, we'd get everything started. By 5.20, we'd be breaking down, the last ring would be going. By six o'clock, we were done, ready to close the doors, no matter how many. We always ran 12 rings at the same time. We had uh, uh, 60 judges going. We had 80 workers. We had a computerized system, everything. At the moment they call, okay, this division, they call the people this division, someone prints it, runs the paper over boats. We had food that was like beyond belief, so it cost a lot of money to do. Right. And didn't really make much money, but uh, we ran it all the way through to 2013. So um, 13 years, I think it was. Yeah. And then um, at that point, you know, it was going down, tournaments were starting to get less and less people. And I just knew, I said, if we do it next year, we're going to lose so much. And sure enough, that year, almost everyone's tournament lost big. Okay. And at that point, you know, we were on to different things. Okay, Sifu said, I got to write a book. You know, mm -hmm. let's get working on this. So I helped Sifu with his book. Boom, 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 get that going. Um, and we were always on to something else, something else, something else. But real quick, I call it kind of like the blessing and the curse with styles like Hunga, styles like Wing Chun, Wing Chun Ooh. don't say it. Uh, they instantly think Ip Man or they think Bruce Lee. People say Ooh. Hunga, they instantly think Wong Fei Hong. So Ooh. the movies back then, when people, if people still do walk in your uh, guys at school and uh, they kind of, um, they, they see this kind of stuff, do they really think, I'm going to fight like Jet Li, I'm going to do this stuff? Or like, yeah. you humble them real quick and be like, listen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so when, when, <laughs> when they see the application of the techniques, because applications are, are they call up such a, a faster movement, yeah. uh, people are like, wow, it's, it's not as cut and dry as that. But if you look closely, their movements within the forms. So eventually they get, they get to see, wow, okay, it is that. And okay, now I see why it's like this. Um, uh, you know, but also we had people, you know, like in the beginning when we first up when we had people come and challenge. Oh. And, you know, we had to, you know, humble some people out of here really quick. <laughs> so, you know, like, you know, I've heard other people around the world talk about, well, oh, yeah, someone came in and I called the cops. I was like, no, 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 why? No such thing as call the cops. You walk in, you're going to be carried out, you know, and, yeah, and, and that's a thing. And, and, you know, that happened many an occasion, you know in the beginning yeah. in the first couple of years of the school it did and then i got that reputation that you know you know you know how people say oh kung fu can't fight yeah you know they got all this mindset but everybody says kung fu can't fight at that school because they knew someone who made the mistake of entering you know no absolutely i guess when i when i first before i actually started training in kung fu because you know you see the movies you're exposed to that first you were like well hungar i thought was the southern style but then when you see the movies there's more like emphasis on the kicking and it's like, you know, stuff like no, that right yeah. exactly so you're just like and then you got to tell people listen this yeah, is the it's, a, it's, style. it's a lot of education you know and people get educated really quickly really and, and incidentally a side note on the movies so my uh, uh, my grandmaster's son, Grandmaster Yen Ling's son, Yen Yao Chin, I mean, I'm sorry, that's my uncle, uh, Yun Kai Ji, he's the one who's a screenwriter for Once Upon a Time in China, uh, oh, Jackie really? Chan's uh, Drunken Master, he won the Golden Horse for a Kung Fu Ghost Story, you know, wow. the Ghost Story movie, He was he's like a major screenwriter, so he's done a lot of the movies that are out there, so okay. pretty interesting. Oh, you yeah, know, that is very interesting tidbit. Yeah, listen, I, I've watched the, like the Once Upon a Time in China, all those movies, and then you get kind of like you're saying educated very quickly as you start actually uh, practicing the actual arts, right? Yes, um, yes. 
So let's let's jump ahead. Let's talk a little bit about um, your being uh, your master's disciple, but not only that, but taking his actual name. Um, so not only did you do the by sea ceremony and everything, which is when you become an actual disciple, um, but what made you decide to that? Hey, I'm going to go ahead and do this formally and take on his name because legally you changed it, correct? Yes, yes. So in 1997, uh, we went to Malaysia, uh, Hong Kong, uh, Shaolin Temple, and Southern China together. While we were in um, Malaysia, uh, we were visiting one of the Honga associations there from another disciple, Wang Fei Hung. And uh, they, you know, throughout the time, they were always saying, wow, you guys look more like father and son. You don't look like teacher and disciple. That's so <laughs> weird, you know? And so we heard this a lot and it was a joke, right? So um, years later, you know, there's always turmoil within, uh, you know, organizations, things like that. and. You know, Sibu said, well, something happens to me coming back and forth. You know, back then he decided to establish something in China under his, uh, you know, when after his dad died, to, uh, he established something in the name, a lineage in China. So in his father's town, which was Toisan or Taishan, as they say. Um, and so um, he said, if something happens to me, then, you know, things are going to go to crap here. You know, but if you're my son, that was the word. If you're my son, I know I would never have to worry. You know, and then we joked about it. We said, OK, and then some things were going wrong. And then he was like, you know, do you want to do it? And I was like, I got to ask my family first. <laughs> you know, I got to ask why? my kids. And, and, you know, I asked everyone and everyone was like, well, why not? Kung Fu's your life. And my daughter's request was just don't lose the connection to us in the name, okay. which is why when we went to the lawyer and we did everything and um you know it's a little bit of work but when we did everything you know i asked that when my when it comes through when it gets approved that my name is pedro anthony sapero i took out the anthony i moved sapero to be my legal middle name and okay. then i used uh ye as my legal surname so like i go to the airport they they say mr ye mr ye and i come up and they're like uh oh, one second one second mr ye and mr lee I'm like, does right. this help? And then like, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I said, no, that's a good joke I use. Right. But, you know, that's that's my name. My teacher's like, show your driver's license, see? He's a Yi. Right. You know, I'm in the Yi family, I'm in their lineage or everything, you know, and then it's in, we did a lot of documentaries in China, you know, talking about it and, and making it clear to everybody, you know, that I became his son in that way and in a legal way. And we made the announcement in one of our tournaments, I think it was 2003, because that was the year that it happened. September 2003, September 19th, and I think it was September 23rd or 22nd was our tournament. We actually made the announcement there. Right, I read about that. Yeah, mm -hmm. very formal. Yeah, I'm sure you got the, the jokes coming up as you did that. It's like, you know, like a uh, Puerto Rican guy walks in with the Chinese name into a bar. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> right. yes. 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 So, you uh, accepted by, by the family, and that's awesome. Your daughter said we keep the name, but mm -hmm. we all know there's always some politics in the in the, in the Chinese mm -hmm. world on the other side. Did you get any right. pushback from your uh, Kung Fu brothers or anything in the beginning? So, so there, there were there were um, some pushback in there, you know, because there was already problems going on uh, with some of the people who were above me, etc. But uh, eventually, they chose just to leave, and then in that case, we ended up. Um, just continuing what we're doing. You know, like Sifu said, let me handle the politics. You just keep doing what you're doing. That's it. Okay. So I just focused on teaching, uh, going out and showing, traveling tournaments, uh, going to Europe, going here, going there. You know, you know, I've been to California, Tat Wong's tournament, everything. And, you know, just going to China and demonstrate Malaysia. Just keep going, keep going, keep going and just keep the name growing. You know, that's what I focused on. I did what he told me and he said, I'll take care of the rest. Okay. And that was it, you know. Today there's no there's no problems. Everybody knows you know where we're at, and we're one big happy family. It takes time to make a good family, right? Because there's always going to be struggles, you know. Yeah, of course, there's always that, but there's still family at the end of the day, and it's been well, so this, many years now. <laughs> I'm well, this is why. Right well, still, but this is why we created our ranking system to be really particular. So we actually moved it a little bit off of the traditional way, in which the most senior. You know, like uh, he, a guy comes back, he trained for six months, says, I'm your senior, you have to you have to bow to me. Mm. Sifu made the school based upon the rank. So we have, you know, the beginner levels up to the black sash level, which is like a Joe Gao assistant instructor. But and then we have the Sifu levels. We have 10 levels of the Sifu. Right. Okay. So in doing so that, you know, that determines seniority within the art, you know, but they all have years 
of uninterrupted training before you can test for those levels too, in addition to the requirements. Yeah. So that makes it okay. Yeah, a lot more mm-hmm. structure. I like that. Mm-hmm. So talking a little um, external versus internal, I, you're, mm-hmm. I know you're very heavy into the Qigong, which is a, mm-hmm. a great thing to do. And that also like led your, your studies into the Chinese medicine. So yeah. when you were starting that uh, as you go, but the, the, the whole desire to help people, is that why you kept up with that? You started to yes. That brand so, more? so as you teach, you realize you if people come to you for um, self-esteem, they come to you for, to get in shape, they come for you to become strong and self-defense and all that. But <clears throat> there's always something else there. It's like, well, how can I help you more? They'll get injured, right? So because I learned the, the, the trauma medicine, I would work on them. But even though I made their shoulder better, their knee better, their back better, but there was always something else there. So I try to see, well, what, what else could be there? So I, I delved more into, from the Dittan medicine, I worked on like a chiropractor and I kind of adjusted him. And he's like, you can't do that, only you know osteopaths and whatever I can do. I said, okay, no problem. He says, if, if certification ever comes in New Jersey, you better get licensing and da da da, because that's going to be a problem. So I started looking for what to do. I found uh, some courses under Bill Helm in California. He was one of the founders of Pacific College Oriental Medicine. I went out there in San Diego to study with him in the tw- uh, in the Shanghai Rolling tr- uh, Train Out Therapy, which had both internal and external applications. You know, uh, disorders, respiratory disorders, digestive disorders, uh, reproductive disorders, as well as injury medicine and then i went to regular massage school to try to get a license uh or the, you know the state certificate so just in case and then it was true it became licensing and i was actually on the board that created the licensing in new jersey and um so i was grandfathered in and uh that's what i did but there was something more i needed to help people with so when i realized emotions had a lot to do with it and i said well what addresses emotions and that was medical qigong so i found the teacher dr su wo shi who i apprenticed with for around 10 years also and uh i learned medical qigong and that kind of stuff with him and in doing so i you know sensing energy is good but be able to sense that and help them in that and now i can help people holistically like totally holistically yes yes so so i'll let you in on something i grew up uh the 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 son of a uh, of a doctor so western nice. medicine like prevailed nice. in my household and then but as i got to know more on the 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 uh eastern side of things and i started practicing mm-hmm. martial arts i would come you know and talk to my dad about things and he was like ah you know his point of view would be like ah if it's not really like a licensed person to, don't go to a chiropractor you go to a specific back doctor like so yeah. Yeah. as we have those discussions i would talk about things like hey but but the you know like when you come in with certain ailments it's like this, this is like someone who's experienced in eastern medicine that is like close to you know like practicing also in martial arts they know exactly where to go it's like versus going into your to your doctor so um talk to me a little bit back because i know there's some pushback with that but also like things that you've seen over the years have you you know like co- things that have commonly been kind of cured or have like um you've been able to uh, handle a little bit better with your background uh, yeah. in, in uh, eastern medicine um uh, right. like let's say like autoimmune diseases that do you guys address things like that or have you ever seen anything like those kind of things? We've, had, we've had uh some of those and i've also worked with a lot of cancer patients also um okay. and you know a lot of things you know so stress you know in the western point of view like your dad would agree um that in the western point of view stress is the number one cause of cancer right yes, um sir. so emotions in excess cause stress right so it's not far off right um but certain emotions affect different organs when those emotions affect the organs what happens right Mm -hmm. that organ gets too much energy or too little energy and then things get stuck and don't run so when something gets stuck and the blood sits there it gets dirty and it creates heat and it creates mucus and it creates cancer right so uh i i've had many doctors lay on my table and i have doctors presently who come to me for their stuff and um and nurses and and i it's the problem is just vocabulary the understanding is is not too different it's our approach and vocabulary which makes them weary but when i had one one doctor on my table and we went head to head on the different diseases and he's like oh my god well that means this and then we realize it's just vocabulary but i've had you know people who came in with a cancer and then um because i knew the emotional root and i'm able to pinpoint six months away from usually six months from when uh they got diagnosed to a trauma six months before and once i pinpoint that and the trauma comes up they go to tears i wish i had stock in kleenex because everybody cries but <laughs> i'm not crying you're crying 
But right. when you get there, many of them have gone into remission. Oh, very nice. So it's almost like cutting the root, right? And then when sure. you cut the root, they're able to do it. And then, you know, I work on things to make systems stronger, right? And, and because I understand the, the mechanism of how it comes, I have an idea of how I can help. And if it works and if it's in, you know, in God's you know, hands, whatever, that's, that's going to be the answer for them. I just help to get them in a good place here, here, and then strengthen the systems to become weakened by the cancer. And the hope is that that goes away. Those are one of the more serious things that I've dealt with. But I've, I've had people, you know, with different types of, uh, you know, autoimmune diseases, which just went away. And, you know, people get with this fibromyalgia and all this kind of stuff. And sometimes right. it's just constant movement that's going to help get things back in order. But again, the mind is, is more important than anything, right? The mind is the command, right? The, the heart's commander, but the mind is telling the body what to do. Right. And if you can control this and then control the emotion and find peace like meditation, then then you have less incidence of sicknesses in your life. Right. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, no. And it makes a lot of sense. So it's like, you know, East versus West people. They, but does it cure cancer? It's like, well, Western doesn't either. So mm -hmm. but there's like mm -hmm. commonality, like you're saying, which, um, yeah, I, I appreciate you um, talking about that a little bit. So let's mm -hmm. talk about because you already talked about this a little bit. Um, you guys, uh, you started teaching abroad, doing seminars, doing all this stuff. You sent me a clip yes. of you teaching the military, which I thought was so super, super cool. I'm gonna that really quick. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Talk to me about this training, how this all went down. Is this a so, This is in through. So Don Hamby was invited also at okay. times. So um, uh, uh, Guillermo Maurice, right? He's the Sifu Guillermo Maurice has established many schools. And so he has students who actually um, established a military um, martial arts system. Right. So whenever they invite Peru, I always get asked to come in and do a workshop for them. And here I speak about doing particular uh, anything close hand combat. These guys are the um, the Marines. They call Marines of War, and this is the amphibious unit, right? And but these guys go out and fight in the Amazon every weekend, right? They go against the Contras and you know the drug things. So they need stuff that works right away, right? right? So um, in doing, yeah. And I, on this particular technique, you see, I, I leopard paw the throat, right? Yeah. And then the, the the sergeant here says, you know, he says, oh, could you please explain to them that you cannot uh, do this on the weekend when you're fighting out in the club because you're going to jail. We can't help you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So, yeah. Some stuff is only to be used when you when absolutely necessary. Right. And, and these guys were taking this knowledge so they can take into the field, you know, that weekend, you know. And yeah, use something that, that's that's practical, right? Yes, like, and yes. especially when you got on heavy equipment and all that, mm -hmm, you're not necessarily mm -hmm. gonna be throwing like tornado kicks at guys. No, no. Not. So like the last trip out, I you know, I taught them uh six elbows of home guard, right? We have like fourteen elbows in the style. But I taught them a drill with the six that they can do it's really short to develop gain and develop power. And then I taught them all different techniques to do with that. And they loved it so much that night uh the, the colonel guy came up to me and he's like, you know, could I ask your favor? Um, can would you allow us permission to write this into our training for the Marines of oh, the wow. self-defense training? And I was like, sure, why not? And I was like, okay, thank you, <laughs> you know? Yeah, shoot. Um, so rounding it back home to, to home base, you, you, were, you were at our 50th anniversary, and then I saw yes. over the weekend or the last year you did the 50th anniversary, uh, the Dragon Style. Um, yes, got see if we get Wing Hong, yes. Yes, so... Um, how did that all go down? And, and um, you obviously did a little bit of a form here. Yeah, I did a little bit of iron wire form here, the internal form, but a little more with a little bit more explosive and speed. Uh, here wasn't to develop the internal power, but was to release the internal power, right? Um, and um, everybody, all the teachers got put on the spot. They said no one's going to demonstrate. And then all of a sudden they started calling everyone up, name by name. And I mean, you know, it didn't matter if you were 80 years old or, or, or like me, 60, right? You're, you're up. Yeah. You and go. there you go. And exploding and pop bomb and. And just, yeah, do, do your thing and it comes naturally. Yeah. Uh, might as well. Yeah. <laughs> 
I appreciate this because again, even like our 50th anniversary, it's just everybody coming together as a family and yes. you know, you, everybody celebrating for a great cause. And, um, you know, you realize that the time is short at the end of the day. It's like, it seems yes. long, but man, it's yes. a lot. Cause I'm not as experienced as you. I've only been doing it for like 25 years, but still like, even to say that and it just goes so quickly. So it really you know. doesn't. That's a good thing to talk about just for a second, you know, is that family, right? And yeah. when we all come together, we may not see each other once a year or here or there, but it's the love that of each other. Right. And we're right there. We're hugging each other. You know, it's all in the heart. And that's because we all put the blood, sweat and tears and time in and we're all trying to preserve what we have. And, and you know, I, I think it, it's it, it'll go on forever. I'm not worried about that. Yeah, me too. Um, now I want to do my uh, my final segment with you. My five crucial yes. questions for Kung Fu Masters. <laughs> yes. So, uh, uh, are you good to go on these? We got. Ah, you go for it. Whatever. Yeah, I'm good. All right. Well, most of it's due to social media, right? So uh, people promoting the things that are going to promote them to make them look better. Um, you know, everybody you hear now a lot because Kung Fu was the first MMA, right? They say because we, you know, every style, every stylist trained different things. I mean, I studied Swai Jiao Chinese wrestling. I studied Wing Chun. I studied Tai Chi. You know, I, I, I've touched upon the karate arts. Uh, um, you know, we... we combine stuff because everyone's looking for a way or their expression of, of, of fighting. So, but within the MMA, you know, I have a lot of patients that are MMA champions that are in UFC. Um, they come in and, and the second they feel my hands, they're like, oh my God, you can kill somebody with that. I said, well, you know, we train for that. And then we get into a deep conversation. It's because you, you, you have the media pushing this thing because they're trying to promote something. But when you come head to head with each other, you come to talk. And then they get to see, then they ask me, show me take me to me. They do something and I do something. They're like, wow, that's brilliant. Well, how come you guys are not in UFC? It's not in my mindset. I'm too busy helping people out here. That's my, my thought. But I think a lot of people are, uh, are, are satisfied with just uh, demonstrating and showing. But you know, if, if you've seen like our demos and stuff, we've always combined form and fighting. You know, my people are not allowed to enter tournaments unless they're also fighting, right? right because we want to show that too. And, and, and the deal is fighting has to be kept real. It, it right. cannot be, you know, uh, uh, Joe's going to go, hey, yo, and then you're just going to go up and you go down. Block with the right, distracting back fist, number one side kick, and spin crescent kick. There we go. Boom. Got him. Got him. Got you, didn't you, Rick? No, I was just doing what you told me to do. No, this has to be, ah, it has to be real, how it works for real in fighting. Come with whatever you got, full contact, no holds barred, okay? I'm gonna warn you, I don't think you're gonna like how this ends, hot shot. Kung Nai? Sparring stances? Sit And a lot of people may not have that experience, right? You know, I'm lucky that I come from a lineage where my Sifu's had that experience and his Sifu's had that experience. And we've always been in that security portion business where we use that martial art. I've used it on the street too. Um, so a few line answers with my students, they've seen me, you know, in action. And, uh, you know, it's always protecting someone. You know, my thought is to protect someone. I don't have any thought of becoming famous, you know, right. in, in that respect. Right, and then there are some 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 um, fighters in UFC that had started in kung fu. So like Kung Lee comes to mind. There's a few guys that did mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. There's definitely value there. Um, and there are some fighters now going to kung fu, right? Right, right. Um, yeah. So yeah, there's, there's 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 a lot of things that yeah, a lot of kung fu being. You know, they're seeing a lot of kung fu techniques like from the baji and things like that, and they're bringing it in and they're saying, oh, you know, this is a new technique in MMA. Well, this is comes from baji. This comes from here. Right. Da, da, da. But, you know, in the end, the value, when you're on the street, you know the value of what you have. So a lot of people are going to the point of dropping forms and that's doing individual techniques and drills, right? That's good. That works. But to not have... So imagine you have a notebook, right? How are you going to remember 5,000 techniques or combinations and things like that? Right, forms were just put together in a way for you to remember, right? And then the training was added into it. Somebody was really smart, but, <laughs> um, but 
this is your dictionary of fighting techniques. You have to just know how to pull from your dictionary, your book, right? The book you always have with you. You never leave it at home. You never forgot it. It's there, right? You create the combinations based upon the instances that happen with you, you know? And, and, and so in that respect, you know, forms are necessary because they teach so much. I mean, you see people who just do drills, they get bored, they eventually leave. Or people who just do fighting, they eventually leave. Their, their career is really short because they get bored. But right. the things and the treasures that are locked in the form, I'm saying the treasures, there's so many treasures and so many things to discover. I've got two guys on the floor right now. These guys for the last four years, they'll take one technique for four months every Wednesday for an hour work together and creating combinations from it and better ways to use it and understanding of body power, connection, speed, gig, I mean everything. And, and people don't spend this kind of time anymore. And this is why, you know, uh, they don't know the value of the forms and the work, but these guys take the movements from the forms and then work it out. So that's the reverse, right? But you need the form first. It puts it in your body. If it's not natural in your body to move, you will not use it when you have a fight. I knew when I got into martial arts that um, I wasn't Chinese and I knew that I would get uh, a lot of prejudice for it. But in my mind, I always knew if I worked from the heart and I just kept pushing and doing the right thing, it's impossible. In my mind, I put it's impossible for the person who's teaching me not to notice. Mm -hmm. Because there's nobody who's going to put in more work than I in my mind. There's nobody who's going to honor it more than I. And there's nobody who's going to put it out there more than I. This was in my mindset. So, you know, my teacher, you know, uh, admittedly in, in like 85, whatever, he was prejudiced. He wasn't taking any Chinese disciples, mm -hmm. right? There's one person who actually put it out in an article and, and called me first, you know, he passed away since, God rest his soul. And he said, before I put this out, I want you to see it and please show it to Sipo, ask him if he's okay with me. And then I showed it to Sipo and Sipo was like, of course, that's the way I was. That's okay to put it out. So he put it out there, but you know, shortly after that time, Sifu started seeing the value of the people who were really putting in the work. And we started becoming, you know, then like my first discipleship was 1987, mm. you know, and then my second one was 1980, uh, my 1994, you know, and, and um, he grew to love that, to, to know that it's in the heart. You're real hot, bro. But I knew I would have that prejudice. But you know, even I'm out there, people always say, "Oh, Lofa, la 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 la," right? You know, the, the yeah. white the white dude doing even right. even yeah. the, the God <laughs> the old Godfather. Right. I did line dance for him, and and uh, you know he passed away since he was on the cover of Time magazine, and I did for him. And then when I came out, he was all oh. he was ah. Oh. Good for a, good for a white boy, right. and I was like, "All right, I'm Puerto Rican, but okay, thank you." <laughs> Not exactly, but yeah. Not exactly. But but you know, people come to respect when they see you move, they see you do stuff, then they respect you. So I tell my students, if you have to use it in a real situation, uh, don't try to think. Place your hands down and just react. Right, because you trust in your kung fu, it's going to be there for you. You practice hard, it's going to be there for you. Um, you know, uh, one of the instances was a two. I was at finish the line dance, and it was at uh, we line dance for some party, and then there were two people fighting. And they're like, Pedro, Pedro, can you go stop it? And I went to stop, and then the guy turned on me and went to throw the punch, and I straight out of the bungee form. I stepped behind Dragon, grabbed, grabbed behind the neck, and I said, stop, right? And then he went to punch again, so then I gripped him, right? And his knees went weak, and I grabbed his arm, and I threw him to the car. Now, uh, my bad intention was to throw him through the car window. <laughs> but it happened to be his car, and his wow. girlfriend is standing by the car crying, and my student opened the door, and he, like, flew right in the seat, right? Um, that was one incident. Another incident was... Um, I have a friend who owned a, a, a hair salon and um, someone was terrorizing them. And then one day I told her, just call me and leave the phone and I'll come. And I did. And, and when he came out, he jumped out, I had something in his hand. I jumped, I grabbed his throat, grabbed his hand. Somebody was coming behind me. I spun around, hit my shoulder, I grabbed him back and I dragged him out and I held him till the cops came. Mm, you know? gotcha. So, um, but I was in court, so, um, but it was eventually dropped but I had to go to court for a number of months on that. And I didn't hurt him, I just made him stop.
don't get discouraged, right? It's it's not the first thing on everyone's mind, and finances usually are, right? So they are always going to choose between uh, what they need and and you know and what the luxury is. But even if a person you show them and they leave, it doesn't matter. Your job as an instructor is to pass on the knowledge. If it's a pass on the knowledge, it doesn't matter. You teach for life, and eventually, someone, one or two people, will hold on. You know, I've got students who open, now I have 15 branches in Scotland descended from me. I've got, you know, uh, 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 Italy descended from me. You know, I've got people across the United States descended from me. This was my goal was to make sure that I can pass it to the next generation because the teacher's job is to do just that, right? Is to pass the knowledge. And once you do that, you feel good in your heart because I know it will live on if I die tomorrow, right? I did what I was supposed to. And I think any teacher in anything, that's the deal, right? You make the next generation and now all the blood, sweat and tears of my grand teachers and great grand teachers, et cetera, are not, you know, they won't go to waste. And I didn't do this for the money, but it's the only thing I do, this and the medicine. Since right. 93, 91, it's the only thing I've done. Yeah. is this in the medicine and you know it, it, it has been a harder life but it probably would have been better off if I had a regular job along the way right. but I, I, I was able to be there for my kids and, and every second my whole life I can you know set my life the way I want and be where I need to when I have to be and, and I was able to grow the art that way you know uh, my Sifu my Sigong told my Sifu if you're going to live teach the art he said to live it because in this way, it's the only thing you do. And then my teacher told me, Pedro, what else do you have to do? One year I got up, I said, well, I've been working out. I work out every, I, I work out every morning, I don't. And, and he's like, you know, but what else is to do? You don't have to go to computer school, learn computer. You don't have to, you know, go to lawyer school. You don't have to do this. We just do Kung Fu, we love it. So imagine your whole life is this. So right. why, why should you get tired in the morning? You're practicing what you love, right? Right. I was like, I am. And and so for me, people get really they're freaked out. They're like, you can't practice every day. And I do. <laughs> yeah. And I do with different focuses, you know? It becomes a lifestyle. People don't understand it, that. It's yeah. me. It's 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 my is it's inseparable. I am I am the art. You know, right. the art is me. So Right. I love that. All right. Well, Sifu Pedro, thank you so much. Sifu Supero. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for doing this. And, and before I wrap up, let people know if they want to train with you specifically, uh, best way to reach you, website and all that. Okay. So we're in Clifton, New Jersey at 68 Union Avenue on the first floor. I've been there and we'll be there. I just signed another five-year lease. So I'll be here until I'm 65 for sure. Nice. Um, uh, our website is www dot yees hunga.com y-e-e-s-h-u-n-g-g-a.com um that's the entrance way to us and we're the clifton new jersey we're the united states headquarters um and we're here you know almost every day except uh like sunday um and classes are run uh, on tuesdays through fridays okay great so uh yeah guys reach out to uh master yi and um go do, uh, train some hunga or at least check it out because it's worth yeah. it <laughs> thank you so much i really appreciate everyone thank you and there you go another five crucial questions answered by yet another kung fu master so what say you were you feeling the interview and all those cool gems that sifu pedro dropped on us as usual let me know in the comments below and do share the video because it helps so much with this algorithm and getting the word out there so we can keep on growing keep on bringing you the content that you enjoy my links to my other socials are all over here so you can check those out and now as promised some yi sunga self-defense techniques from sifu supero yi himself cuando da el puño tienes que coger espacio importante para que esto no tiene chance de salir. Pero si yo lo de aquí, eso aquí. Si mi pie se pasa de debajo, debajo de él un poquito más, eso es más fácil. Si pase más, se va más para, para atrás. Otra vez. Tres. So, tijera, hermano dragón, el tigre de la cara. Este uno, dos, tres. 
Ahora, dale. There you go. So effective or nah? Leave your thoughts in the comments below so we can keep the combo going. Guys, thanks as always for the support and a big thanks to Sifu Supero Yi for being a part of this video. Hey, this is Sifu Pedro Supero Yi. I just want to say thank you for watching Kung Fu Chronicles. Guys, stay safe. Check out a couple other videos you'll enjoy over here. See you all in the next round and keep punching.